Hello and welcome to Brit Sci-Fi from the National Space Centre. A massive thanks to all of our contributors uh, for making the festival happen. And a big thank you to uh, Alliance agents who have set up this afternoon's uh, interview uh, with the fantastic uh, Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, who are better known as the Doctor and Perry from Doctor Who. So let's cut across to them right now. Hello and welcome. Hello. 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 I hope you're all well. I hope you've been very busy and and keeping yourselves uh, uh, doing fun things. I'm I'm transfixed by that shirt, Colin. That is fantastic. My cyber shirt. Cyber shirt. I think we all need cyber shirts. Um, a huge thank you for joining us and a mass. Oh goodness. Hello. Super super close up. <laughs> extreme close-up um a massive thanks obviously you have both been brilliant guests and joined the national space center on many occasions so i can't thank you enough and for joining us here today um we've asked um the fans to send in their questions in advance and we have had a lot uh so we've only got 60 minutes so we'll uh, we'll get through as many as we can so if you've submitted a question um we're going to uh, ask it now so colin the first question comes in for you uh and it's from claire and she said you trained as a solicitor so why the career change do you still take an interest in the law um i take an interest in avoiding um being arrested certainly <laughs> um, when, I'm, when i'm driving my car anyway um, yeah, I trained as a solicitor because when I was 18, my father said, what do you want to do? I said, I wanted to go to university. I wanted to study classics, as it turned out. And while I was there, I wanted to join the, I thought I would go to either Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> and I said, I would like to join Ouds or Footlights while I was there with a view to becoming an actor because I saw that as a route to doing that which I enjoyed most in life. I was at that time a member of the, all the local amateur drama groups. And my father hardly paused after he heard that and said, you start in the solicitor's office on Monday. So I started in the solicitor's office on Monday because when I was 18, I wasn't exactly forceful with my rather old fashioned and strong father. So for five years, I studied law and joined every drama group within 20 miles of Manchester. Uh, I was in a large number of plays uh, and enjoyed every second of it. And my law studies didn't get as much attention as perhaps they should have done. Uh, and then when my father, four years into it, had a heart attack and a subsequent stroke because he worked too hard, was faced with the possibility of spending my life doing something I didn't like doing very much uh, and ending the same way at the age of 49 as he was. Uh, so I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. And I uh, left the law just as I was about to do my the second half of my finals and auditioned for drama schools. And the rest, as you say, is history. But I know how to read a contract. So uh, when I get sent one that is designed by idiots for morons, I make it perfectly clear that I'm not going to sign it. And it's come in very useful over the years. So in that sense, yeah, I do like the law still. Fantastic. Remind me never to send you a contract, Colin. I'm terrified already. <laughs> Please do. But don't just send one that you've copied from something else, which is not relevant to what we're doing. No, I'll definitely leave it to the professionals. Um, Nicola, was yours a similar routine? Did you train uh, to be an actress or did you have a different career in mind when you set out on this path? Um, I wanted to go on stage, but I wanted to be Margot Fontaine. I wanted to be a ballerina and I wanted to be in Swan Lake. Um, and these were my ambitions from about the age of four or five. Um, However, I didn't get to go to ballet school for similar reasons in a way that Colin ended up going to the, the law office. Um, my father said no to ballet school uh, because my school had said it was a waste of a good brain. So I carried on at regular school and then when I finished, I said, I'm going to drama school at which point my parents were very supportive. 
Um, but in between, I just pined for ballet because I felt that uh, my the, my first love had been taken from me. Uh, but my mum got me to join local amateur dramatic societies and I did musicals and I thought this was a pointless waste of time the first time I went, but um, I got the role of the second youngest sister in Fiddler on the Roof. And at the time I was... 15 and, or 13, I think it's good, right? You had to be 16 to join, but I was two years younger, so I was 14. So I had to pretend I was 16, pretend I knew what O-levels I was doing. And when I did the musical, although I only had three lines, I loved every minute of the acting that you could fill in all the gaps in between. So that changed me onto the acting path. And then I went to drama school. And then I got seen by the agent who was in fact the son-in-law of um, Mr. Hartnell. So that's how I got my Doctor Who audition. Fantastic. Both really good paths uh, there. Um, it leads us on to another question for you, Colin. Um, Helen would like to know, uh, a lot of your early TV work was very, um, she's used the word serious, I think classical, things like war and peace. Um, how did you get, uh, how did you make the change to wacky sci-fi? Her words, by the way. <laughs> her, her words and not yours. Um, you see, the, the simple answer is that the use of the word serious um, kind of belies the question, really, because everything you do, you have to approach seriously. So what ends up as wacky sci-fi in your eyes is just as serious for me as playing Prince Anatole in War and Peace, which I did in 1970, or those other classic serials which occupied my time back then. Um, they all approach in the same way. You're serious when you're working. That's a very serious business. But in between the work and around the work, you approach it, I hope, with a sense of enjoyment and fun. So there was as much laughter on set during War and Peace as there was wackiness on set during uh, Doctor Who. Um, in fact, the wackiness was usually provided by things going wrong rather than the actors not being serious about what they were doing. So really, acting is, is like a grown-up game of what if. What if this was happening to you and you were this person? And you're pretending. And the only way to pretend is not to mess about, not to do it half-heartedly, not to be self-conscious, certainly, but to give it your 100% of your serious endeavour whilst being aware of the effect, the effect it's having um, on those who are watching it. So yes, if it's something serious, you want them to think it's serious. If it's lighthearted, ditto. And if it's wacky, then uh, you, you want them to think, well, that's wacky, if it's supposed to be wacky. But uh, for me, sci-fi is, is very serious. It, it's no less serious than Shakespeare. What Shakespeare wrote was fanciful and outside the experience of most of the people watching it. Ditto Doctor Who. In fact, Doctor Who's a lot closer to the experience of some people watching it, some of whom might be considered wacky. <laughs> Oh, I feel really bad now for asking the question. I think a lot of people always forget how much hard work goes into acting. I think people just assume that what they see on the screen is just you going to work and just reeling off some lines and it just happens. The magic is made. But the reality is years of training and learning lines and being that character and all the other things that go with it. It's, it's a massive, massive task. So, yes, apologies for the question. Um, you are the messenger. You will not be punished. <laughs> oh goodness thank you <laughs> um we've got so um nicola you've alluded it to it somewhat uh, of how you got the role uh, as perry but charlotte has asked um how did you get the role as uh, uh, in doctor who uh, and anna has asked colin you first appeared as commander maxill previously so oh, there go headphones uh, oh gosh um so what was it like going back to play the doctor so nicola if i could pick up with you first 
Sure. Um, well, I was at Weber Douglas and we were going to do our final school production, which was No, 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 Net. And I was not going to be picked for the lead because there were all these very good singers who'd had singing tutorials and I had not. So I was a bit disappointed with the last uh, choice because this was my showcase in which to find an agent. But they got an outside director in to do auditions and I was coached for a few weeks beforehand by my then secret husband who was a Broadway musical star. And when it came to the audition, I felt I had nothing to lose. So I gave it my best. And I got the job. So, or job, I should say, the, uh, the part in my finals year. So I'd written to lots of agents, including uh, Terry Carney from an agency called Eric Lapine Smith. And he came to see the show and we were doing the American score. And he made a note that there was one real American and he thought the rest of the cast were British. And so when he saw the breakdown for this new character in Doctor Who, which of course he kept a particular eye on because of his father-in-law having been the first Doctor, um, he immediately contacted me and asked if I would like to audition for Doctor Who. To me, that was such a way out thing. How could this possibly happen to me? I thought it was a friend paying a playing a prank so I hung up on him twice <laughs> oh, wow. um, because I he, it sounded like a put on voice and I had a friend who was very good at doing those kinds of voices so I said okay Paul that's really funny yeah like they're gonna ask me to be in Doctor Who <laughs> get off the phone <laughs> We just like I was just joking, thinking I would just call him back, and, and then there was this message saying, "No, no, no, this is serious." And and then they left a message for me saying, "Would you like to call the agency?" and left the phone number. So then I had to call and apologise, and I got an audition. And um, that was that's how I eventually got the job after many auditions. Wow. Imagine almost turning it down. Wow. That's amazing. What a great story. Um, obviously, they wanted you because they kept hounding and uh, made sure that you were there. So brilliant. Uh, and how about you, Colin? Um, obviously, as as, as um, Anna has said, you, you arrived as Commander Maxwell, but you came back as the Doctor. Was it you were so brilliant or, or what was it that, that how did you get the role? Well, really, that's for others to say, not me. Um, <laughs> Are you seeing me all right? Because I'm looking very um, blurred and how's your vision? All right? It's gone a bit pixelated. I definitely say that. Yeah. And I haven't had a drop either. <laughs> Must be our end. I'll have to stop doing that daytime drinking. <laughs> well, I'll carry on anyway. Um, yes, uh, I was doing a play down in Brighton by chance because uh, that's where John Nathan Turner lived, which I didn't know at the time. Um, and I got a phone call from my then agent saying I'd been offered a part in three episodes of Doctor Who starring Peter Davison. And I remember saying, oh, that's a shame. And he said, why? I said, because I read somewhere that they never cast the Doctor from someone who's been in Doctor Who before. Uh, and my agent said, well, they're not going to cast you as Doctor Who, are they? Which I thought was unkind but never nevertheless i said yes you're probably right and the the dates for the recording of the three studios of um arc of infinity as it was called uh, fitted in perfectly with my theater tour schedule so i said yes and i turned up uh, to play max hill in arc of infinity and i got to shoot the doctor which is one way of getting the job i suppose um and we rehearsed back in those days. You'd have a full week's rehearsal um, for a, 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 a one hour or half hour, as it was then, uh, epi episode of Doctor Who. Yes, it was, full week. And uh, John Nathan Turner came to see the run-through that we 
used to do for him and the technicians. And he said to me, what is this program called? I said, Doctor Who? And he said, not Maxill then. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're playing it as if you're the main character in the story. And I said, well, aren't we all in our own lives, the main character in our stories? Why should Maxill go, oh, I'm only Maxill, and he's the doctor, so I'm going to disappear in the background. Um, he said, well, can you leave a little um, space around you for Peter, maybe, you know? Um, <laughs> and I said, you mean tone it down a bit? And he said, yeah, do me a favour, eh? So I I didn't, actually, but it, I pretended I was toning it down a bit. Um, and then that was the end of that, and I was invited to a wedding uh, a wedding of one of the uh, members of the crew, the, our uh, AFM, assistant floor manager, got married a couple of weeks later and I went and John Nathan Turner was there. And we had a lovely day. We laughed a lot. And he says, and it's, I suppose it's not very good for me to repeat the story, but he says he left that party saying to his, his better half, um, I've discovered my new doctor. Well, I didn't know about that. And he invited me for lunch some time later and uh, asked me if I would take over from Peter. Uh, no audition, no screen test. He just said he saw something in me that he thought would be right for the doctor after the fifth doctor. So I got the most prestigious part of my entire career with the minimum of effort. I have auditioned three times for small parts I didn't even get, let alone uh, yeah. doing any audition for the biggest part I ever got. And that was kind of liberating, really. The fact that somebody had so much confidence that they gave you what is arguably the best part on television um, made it a, a journey of delight for me at all times. So uh, that, yeah, that's my story of how I got to be the doctor. It was obviously meant to be. That's what it was. You know, if you didn't have to audition for it, it was meant to be. You were meant to be my doctor. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, we think it's possibly the Cybermen that are causing the problem on the screen. You know what they're like, they're meanies. <laughs> Shall I take all my clothes off? Would that help? Oh, that would always help. You know, that, that always helps, doesn't it? <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Um, brilliant. So now we know how you got those roles, but uh, David would like to know, what was your favourite storyline? Um, so Nicola and, and Colin, would you like to choose one or, or are there many or was it one of your own or was it another storyline in the show? Do you mean from television? Can we include Big Finish? Oh, definitely. Or, yes, always include Big Finish. The audio stuff is just as good, if not better, if you've got a good imagination. <laughs> so Colin, what was your favourite? Oh, oh, heavens. Um, my favourite of all the ones I've done, I, I think uh, there are so many, but they gave me a regeneration story, big finish, um, which brilliantly meshed perfectly with the beginning of the first moments of Sylvester in dressed in my clothing and getting lost, as he so humorously puts it, every time he discusses uh, the regeneration that I wasn't present for. Um, and they wrote a story that was full of humor, humor, pathos, bravery, courage, the ideal regeneration story. And it ended up with me turning into Sylvester. And it ended up in a stupendous way not in a silly way <laughs> and I and I adored doing that because I'd always resisted the urge to do a regeneration story uh, mainly because if I didn't regenerate I was still the doctor so for about 20 years after I left Doctor Who I was still the doctor because I hadn't regenerated and Sylvester was an imposter you know someone in a in a silly costume and wriggling around inside mine and, you know, uh, a, a, a regeneration is not made from that. You have to have the person regenerating present. So uh, I wasn't present, therefore I hadn't regenerated. But now, thanks to Big Finish, I must admit to having regenerated. 
Yes, regeneration is always my favourite part, just to see how they do it. It's always good. Uh, and how about you, Nicola? What's your favourite storyline? Um, I suppose um, I, I loved doing my Companions Chronicle um, when I did uh, Perry and the Piscom Paradox. But I think as, a, as opposed to just being me and Colin doing that uh, as a sort of two-hander, if I think of the story, it's it's similar to Colin. It's going back and explaining something that wasn't really explained um, in the television series. For example, Perry just got taken out of time and the Doctor never went back to find out if she was okay uh, once we got past the trial and everything. So... That kind of left a bit of a, a hole, really, because I I always thought, well, that's not like the Doctor. And people have often said, well, what did happen to Perry? And is she really married to Yacarnos? Uh, so I think probably the, the Widow's Assassin, uh, which is a, another big Finnish story, um, where it is explained what the Doctor did, and I won't spoil it for anyone who's not uh, heard it, so go and listen to Widow's Assassin, because the story of what the Doctor really did is one of the sweetest, most touching and heroic things I've ever heard that the Doctor could do. And it teaches you about what really happened to Perry and what the Time Lords really did. So... For that reason, I, I really love that story. I think that's the one of the delights of the Big Finish um, uh, stuff, as well as the comics and the books and all the other things that are around the universe of Doctor Who, is that you can build on the characters, you can expand their stories, and all of those questions that we still have about the episodes that were definitely too short as far as we were concerned, certainly where they shortened your episodes and then we we lost you, you know, it, it was, that, that's what we, uh, certainly as a fan, that's what we enjoy. So thank you very much for doing so many of them. It's been a delight to continue the story with you. Um, so that's been brilliant. I, I sound like I'm being very patronising now. Well done. <laughs> but thanks. And I, I love the stories that you've chosen there. Um, right, back to some of the questions that we've been uh, submitted. Uh, Nicola, uh, this is from Michael. He says, you have an amazing voice. How do you decide what to say yes to for voiceover work? Oh, he obviously loves your voice. I just say yes. <laughs> Hired. Um, to be honest, there are only, um, I suppose it's really in the in form of commercial. So there's only two things I've ever turned down. Um, and one was to be, <laughs> don't laugh, um, Miss Adidas. Colin must be laughing. Um, uh, that was for a South African big commercial uh, spread uh, that they were going to do. And at the time, um, British actors had been asked not to work there as part of the, you know, anti-apartheid protests against apartheid so i turned it down even though it was quite a lucrative offer i said no i wasn't prepared to work there given the political situation so that really didn't have a lot to do with my voice but <laughs> turning it down though i think my voice probably got me the job and then the other uh, bearing in mind we have many different age groups probably watching this i was offered a very adult um voiceover to advertise some very adult content and I turned that down too but apart from that I just love doing everything um, all different accents and characters and ages and that is the joy of voice work that you get the variety brilliant thank you oh we've lost Colin oh hello <laughs> oh oh hello Hello, Colin, have you been to Avenue oh. Q? <laughs> it's a new Colin. Hello, Colin. Hello, nice to see you. 
<laughs> I am the doctor, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Do you have a question for me now the imposter's gone? Oh, definitely. We have a great co uh, question for you. We'd like to talk about your costume, if we can there, please, Doctor. Uh, so, oh, Edward and... my costume, my lovely, lovely costume. It, it is yeah. lovely. There it is. Hang on. <laughs> who, who is it oh. you know we're supposed to work with? Is it children and pets? Is there puppets Ignore as well? The he is looking very much in the pink. <laughs> I am in the pink. Uh, <laughs> All right, so, that's not working. <laughs> there it is. It was lovely. Yeah, He's brilliant. It's worth a try, but I can't get my left and right sorted out. <laughs> what did I do with the costume? Um, John Nathan Turner asked me what I would like to wear. He gave me a lot of books about costume and history and all sorts of things, which I devoured. And I said, I would like to wear something. I, what I described basically was pretty much what... I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody. What Chris Eccleston got, in fact, a long black coat, a dark shirt, black, dressed in black, and a long one, a flowing one, maybe a cloak, because it struck me that the doctor doing what the doctor does would probably benefit from being able to disappear into the background on the odd occasion. Um, you know, when uh, things are getting tricky, in the absence of a sonic, which my doctor did not have, um, he, he could just, oh, where's he gone? Can't see him. So what did they give me? Ah, um, the designer of the costume, a bless her heart, was asked to come up with something totally tasteless, which they thought would be a nice kind of uh, characteristic for my doctor to have, to be totally tasteless. And um, she came up with designs, and he kept saying, no, that's a bit too tasteful. No, 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 that's, oh, that's rather nice. No, I don't want that one. So as a joke, she drew something on her sketch pad and said, what, well, you mean something like that? And he said, yes, that's it. So that is what I'm afraid we were stuck with. The only benefit to me ever has been minimal, but impressive. Uh, because when they brought out uh, little... Um, images of us of varying sizes uh, to sell to the unsuspecting public. Um, my costume was bright and garish and attracted the eyes of the young purchasers. So they sold exponentially more of the little six doctor figurines than any of the others, uh, which means that I get 0. 0.000004 of a penny more than the rest of the doctors for each one sold. I love that idea of design by taste and then just going beyond. <laughs> um, so we've got one more additional question from Catherine who was like to know, is it true that you added a cat badge to your costume and was that something personal to you? Is that is that a, a, a thing on the internet or is that real? No, that's real. Um, uh, what happened was that my limited experience of Doctor at that point was seeing uh, Peter Davison. I mean, I'd seen all the previous doctors, of course I had, but I saw Peter Davison with a stick of celery on his lapel. And I thought, well, you have to have some identifying characteristic to wear on your lapel. Now, I've, I'm a great believer in uh, uh, the, 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 the cat as, as a, an entity, really. Uh, think of Rudyard Kipling. I am the cat who walks by himself and all places are alike to me. Well, you can add times to that as well. All places and times are alike to me. So I thought a little cat badge might be quite nice. It, uh, it reflected the persona of the doctor, as well as showing my, and therefore his, um, fondness of cats. And then I came up with the idea of having a different cat badge for each story. And I got somebody that I had, already commissioned to do larger uh, versions of my own cats to do little small ones. So several of the cats that I wore on my lapel were actually images of my own cats, uh, respectively. Who was it? It was Morris and Rover and oh, Eric. The, the black cat was Eric. 
um, all my cats were immortalized on my lapel, which I rather liked. I love that idea, idea, but I always thought Eric was a half a bee. I didn't know he was a cat as well. <laughs> there is a book called Eric or Little by Little, uh, which was a Victorian morality tale. And Eric was a young boy who was very good, loved his parents. And when he was at school, he listened to smutty talk Ooh. in the dorm. And he became infected by smutty talk and spiraled into infamy and shame and died appallingly. It was an awful book. And the, the cat who got the name Eric was a stray who little by little kept coming in through the window and going away again and coming back. And I Aww. fed him and he, he was with us for 13 years. Oh, that's lovely. And I like the fact that you immortalised him on the show as well. So thank you for that. Um, Nicola, uh, we've got a question here from Emma. She says, I think you always looked amazing, but how did you feel about the costumes and did you have any uh, say in what you wore? Ah, uh, my say was... Oh, no. Yeah, at least for the first couple of years. Um, and my main concern was less about how I looked and more about how cold I was. Um, because of all the filming we did outside and it seemed we only, we did most of our filming in the winter um, or at least it was just our, the weather was always bad. So I was usually cold. Um, so much so that in my first story with Peter, um, when we were doing caves, uh, so the first one after Planet of Fire, the first one in England, um, I'd gone from October, 80 degrees, Lanzarote, to uh, uh, Dorset, minus three in November. So I got frostbite, which was fun, uh, on my feet, and pneumonia. And so the thing I didn't like about my costume was I didn't get to wear, like, um, I went yesterday and I sat outside in order to speak to people. And I wore two thermal vests a silk polar neck, a big furry jumper, a um, sleeveless uh, padded jacket, and then a thermal anorak on top. Now, that would have been a suitable costume for a lot of my Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much I feel the cold. Yes, and I was like, Nicola, you look like... Hillsbury Doe woman. I was humongous in this amount of clothing, but I was warm. And so I was able to stay out talking. So stay outside. And I just wished I'd had a pair of jeans, um, some easy shoes to run in, trainers, um, maybe furry boots in the winter, and a nice thermal anorak with some big, warm, cuddly jumpers. That would have been, or t-shirts in the summer, but that would have been my choice of clothing. Um, but I obviously got the very interesting combination of shorts and leotard for quite a while, um, which was odd, really odd. But then I think it was later on that Madonna went for that kind of very clingy look with shorts. So I think really since she emulated me, or Perry, I should say, it, it's not too bad. Makes you a fashion icon. <laughs> I think she warm cuddly me, didn't you? I did. It meant I had to rely on Colin's coat, which had the advantage of being very heavy and warm with a nice soft lining. So between takes, I would dive into Colin's coat with Colin still in it. <laughs> It was hell, I tell you. <laughs> that was hell, was it, Colin? Yeah, he's very brave, man. Very brave. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. We've got a couple of questions now about um, sort of theatrical productions. So John would like to ask Colin, I have fond memories of Doctor Who, The Ultimate Adventure in Nottingham as a surprise present in 1989. Was it in? Uh, was it an enjoyable challenge to take over the lead and reprise the role at a relatively short notice? Well, it wasn't relatively short notice because uh, I knew when John Pertwee started, he was doing the first four months and I was doing the second four months. So I probably had more time uh, to study the role, if you like, than he did. Um, I remember going to see the very first night I think it was at uh, the theatre in Wimbledon. And uh, I was sitting with uh, the producer and some of the uh, team involved, the back of the circle, when John Pertwee made his first entrance out of the TARDIS. And the, the story involved Margaret Thatcher as the Prime Minister, welcoming the doctor who was coming to help her with a problem she had. And the TARDIS landed and the door opened and out stepped into total darkness, John Pertwee, because the lights all went out as he came out of the TARDIS. And knowing John as I did, bless him, I know that would not have enchanted him. Um, he liked to make an entrance, did our John. And I, I, I could sense the waves of impotent rage through the darkness. And obviously the lights came back and he carried on and he was his usual wonderful self. But it, um, it was something I already knew about Doctor Who, that you are very dependent on technology. You were when you were doing it in the studio, and similarly, even more so on the stage, because you couldn't do take two. So it wasn't a great surprise. It was lovely to do, because it was a musical, and before you get overexcited, I did not sing in it. You'll be very pleased to hear, um, because neither John nor I are known for our vocal dexterity in terms of music anyway um and the others did the scene and it was a rather fun show i enjoyed doing it i think it's time we had another stage show get those young whippersnappers doing it that have played it recently because you can do so much more on stage now with special effects than you could when i did it in 1989 but uh, it, it, it was a, a great experience and they asked me if i wanted to change the script because originally it was written for John Pertwee, but he didn't want to do eight months. So they asked me if I'd take over from him. And I read the script and I said, no, um, what the doctor does is applicable to any doctor apart from two things. One, he had a line which was reverse the polarity of the neutron flow, not surprisingly, uh, which I changed to reverse the linearity of the proton flow, which I thought would entertain the the true fans and wouldn't uh, impinge on a, an audience who were oblivious of that particular line. And also there was a bit where he uh, did Venusian Aikido to defeat one of his um, enemies who was attacking him. And I said, I'd rather um, do it in a different way. And I, I decided to have a sword fight without knowing I was having a sword fight. So I had a sword in my hand, which I was using to gesticulate while I was talking to somebody. And somebody was attacking me from behind, who was unaware, uh, well, I was unaware of him. And I defeated it without even knowing he was there. I thought that was quite a nice idea for my doctor. But those are the only changes I made. I love that. And I do apologise for anybody who didn't see it off screen. When uh, Colin said reverse the polarity, I had to do the Forbidden Planet thing. Sorry. Uh, because you're all sitting in the theatre and you reverse the polarity. You have to do it. Sorry. Um, do I'm, you? Apparently. I have seen that before. Oh, sorry. No. I, I'm, I'm such Tell a geek. You've, you've spoiled it for me forever. Sorry. No spoilers, no, sweetie. Sorry. <laughs> um. Okay, following on from uh, talking about theatre, um, uh, Emily has said uh, to both of you, I have seen you in several theatre shows. You were amazing. Do you prefer screen or stage? Uh, Nicola, would you like to pick up on that one? Um, well, I don't have a preference. What I love about being an actor is that your jobs can be very varied and different. And what I like is when you've just been doing a lot of telly or film or something and you get a stage job, you, you go on stage and you go, oh, 
you know, it's like coming home. And I, I love being on stage. And then if you've done a lot of theatre work and then you get to work in television or film again, then you sort of find yourself going, ah, oh, the camera. I love that relationship with the camera. So what I love, I suppose, is the variety. Um, I love doing something different from the thing that I've previously done. And how about you, Colin? Stage or screen or, or a similar answer? What she said. Exactly what she <laughs> said. They both... Uh, the, I mean, the, the basic premise is the same. You're pretending to be somebody else, but the way in which you do it is radically different. On stage, once the curtain goes up, the director can no longer affect that performance. You can sack you so you don't go on stage <laughs> the following but they can't alter what you're actually doing during that performance. You're on your own and you, the, the adrenaline kick is wonderful. And you get the feedback, of course, from an audience, which is like, you know, food to an actor. You don't get the feedback in television, but what you do get is a relationship with cameramen and crew um, who you can look at a cameraman while you're being given a note by a director and a good cameraman will go, <laughs> and you go, ah, oh, that was my instinct too. And uh, you follow the cameraman because he's the man who's looking. I mean, that rarely happens. Usually the director is spot on. But uh, the relationship we developed with Alec Wheel, who was our number one cameraman on uh, Doctor Who, my relationship with him was perfect. And uh, you'd ask him how big the shot is as well. You know, is it full length? Or, so I'd, I'd go like that and he'd go, or, you know, so you know how big to do what you're doing. And film, again, is even different again, because um, in film, you are 20 feet high in front of a, an audience in, a, in a, a cinema, and the slightest twitch looks like you're gurning. So that's why the actors who seem to do nothing convey the most. I remember in one of my earlier films saying to the director, and I thought I was being Joe Cool, doing very little. He said, I said, um, am I doing enough? He said, too much, too much. And I thought I was doing nothing. And that's the clue with films. Just say the lines with minimal expression. Well, different expression to that, but I look mad there. <laughs> but they're, they're, they are very different. And, and to swing from one to the other is a joy. At the moment, because I haven't done any for so long, I'm desperate to get on stage. I would love to do something on stage again. Well, fingers crossed somebody's watching and heard that because we'd love to see you back there. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we've got more questions uh, that have come in. So Colin, again, uh, Karen would like to know, uh, does Big Finish Audio Productions give you the opportunity to take your doctor in the direction he should have gone on TV? Uh, so we've already discussed quite a, a lot about the audio shows, but there are a lot of them. So I would imagine that you've been able to go places that you always wished you could go. Absolutely right. Uh, the one thing that Big Finish offered me the chance to do, and they said so as well, um, because my view of the Sixth Doctor was to give us an arc uh, from what you first saw, which was this kind of rather arrogant, um, over the top, uh, in your face doctor, uh, to find out that inside uh, there was something else going on. And I, the the, the comparison I made at the time was one of my favourite characters in fiction is Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. And for the bulk of that book, you think Darcy is unbearable, opinionated, smug, unpleasant and unkind. At the end, you realise he is the most truly principal character in the whole story. And I like that in fiction. It's, it's like Snape in Harry Potter. The interesting characters are the ones who have the biggest journey. And I wanted my doctor to have a longer, <laughs> a longer journey than television afforded him. And Big Finish came along and said, we we'll see your journey and we will travel it with you. And my doctor has been able to develop far beyond he was ever able to on television. And he remains the same doctor. 
and he still is capable of those moments of hubris, rodimentar, if you like. But it's also, uh, there were stories in there with, um, with all my companions where I was able to show affection, uh, concern, and stories where the softer side of the Sixth Doctor were able to emerge. And I think um, a, a multi-layered character is much more interesting to play than uh, a single goody. Um, usually one of the most interesting parts uh, in, in anything because they're, they're complex and they can, you know, they can be horrible. <laughs> um, whereas a goody has to be a goody. But the Doctor is, a, is different. The Doctor can be multi-layered because he's a time lord. He's been through what he's been through. He's had 13, 14 and many more faces. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at the cover art to see just to see that the, the Doctor was changing in the fact that, you know, you've gone from this sort of very loud and over the top uh, costume. I think on the cover art, you're you're blue or dark blue. So maybe you've even got to that that dark costume. So, you know, he, he has developed, he has evolved uh, um, and, and definitely from speaking to you now, he's evolved thanks to you and your input into that. Um, so that's good to see. Um, thank you. Uh, Nicola, we've got a question for you from Lucy, um, who uh, loved you in Star Trek. So she would like to know, what was it like working on British science fiction as opposed to US science fiction? Um, well, I think I need to do more American science fiction to answer this question. Um, the main difference was I had to further to travel for work. <laughs> Uh, I had to fly, obviously, over to the States and I filmed uh, two episodes over a period of two weeks, uh, which is uh, going quite fast. But the difference is that, obviously, when I was doing Doctor Who, I was in a long-running series, so I was going from episode to episode to episode, um, and we were on a... A particular schedule whereas everything was set up for these two episodes to be made um, in the States so it, it's more of a sort of timing issue what I do know is that back in the 90s I was very good friends with a lot of the actors who were in uh, Next Generation and what I can say is that had I been an extra, a regular extra, in the background of Star Trek, I would have been paid more than I was in Doctor Who. And almost exactly what they got per episode was what I got for a year. So I would say the biggest difference is probably the money. <laughs> wow, I'm off to America. <laughs> Yeah, then I was like, wow. I was like, really? Wow, I should be an extra. <laughs> yeah, you definitely need more American screen time. Definitely. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Colin, um, have you ever played yourself in any computer games The Sixth Doctor is in? So, Alexander has asked that one. Um, I don't know if you've seen yourself in computer games. No. Never. You're a. I don't. I mean, I have done voiceovers in the past, and some of them might have been for computer games. I, I really can't remember. But as far as I'm aware, I haven't done the Sixth Doctor voice for a computer game. They've used my image. I know that. And I may have recorded something years ago, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah, there are a few computer games. One that I've played in the past is the Lego Dimensions, and you can play as the Sixth Doctor. So, uh, yeah, you can run around in your bright and colourful costume and look fantastic. Uh, he has a few of your mannerisms, but it's it's a very funny character. Um, I just and think a voice. That, um, I think there's a voice for a very short period of time, but but uh, it's just little um, snippets. But it's it's just the character, really. You should try it; it'd be oh. fun. <laughs> I may not. May not, okay. <laughs> okay, let's move along swiftly. Charles would like to ask a question of you, Colin, also. Uh, the Five-ish Doctors reboot is one of my comedy highlights. Was it fun to make? 
it was great fun to make. Um, I was approached by Peter Davidson. We'd all been talking to each other during the anniversary year, saying, have they asked you to do anything? Oh, no, no. And Peter and Sylvester and I and, and Paul uh, were all genuinely saying, no, I've not heard a word. So we, we were kind of resigned to the fact that we were not going to be required on voyage, as it were, for that particular journey. And then Peter, who had done some very amusing videos before, uh, apologizing to a convention in America for his failure to attend, he, he, he put together a rather clever, funny um, uh, short recording to say sorry to the people. So uh, he had a history of creativity in that respect. And he said to us, how do you fancy doing our thank you to the fans um, for, uh, as the BBC don't want us? So he wrote the script that you saw, um, The Five-ish Doctors. Um, and we incorporated our families in it to, for a bit of fun. And uh, it was quite interesting that Paul was up for it, but then got a job he couldn't tell us about, we discovered later, which was his um, uh, regeneration sequence that he filmed. So he wasn't able to be there for all the time. And we incorporated that into the story, which was great fun. Um, and we, we, we were delighted to do it. All that stuff with John Barrowman was wonderful. And we laughed a lot. And I have to say, of the Doctor Who's I've done on television, I've watched them fewer times than I've watched the Five-ish Doctors, which I have seen at least half a dozen times. And every time it makes me laugh. And there are some moments of joy in there of the three of us crammed into the TARDIS. And Peter saying it's a bit small, isn't it? Or whatever it was he said. All that stuff was just wonderful. And it's a tribute to him, a tribute to Peter that he's, he got everyone to do it for nothing, we all did it for nothing. And that's why when people say, why don't you do another one? We would, but you couldn't get a crew, a director, um, and all the um, editing done for nothing again. So it would have to be done as a commercial uh, thing. And I believe it should be because uh, uh, the, the three of us were like the three stooges walking down the corridor that time at the end, towards the end. Um, we, we looked such a disparate motley trio uh, that alone was good for a laugh. Uh, it was great fun, and I'm inordinately proud of it, actually. I really enjoyed doing it. It was great to watch, and I definitely think we saw the camaraderie and your enjoyment on the screen. So, yeah, we really enjoyed it as well. I think there's a Kickstarter in there, isn't there? I think all the fans would definitely back a commercial version of the next well, the go. next chapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know who'd, who'd head it up because I don't think Peter likes doing techie stuff. So um, I, I don't know. Uh, but th if there's somebody out there, that definitely sounds like a project, I think. Um, thank you for that. Um, Nicola, Jonathan has asked, what was it like working with so many different doctors? He specifically said Troughton and Pertwee. Um, so, um, um, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, Colin was obviously the best one to work with. <laughs> Colin is my doctor. And I was very blessed to get to work with um, with uh, with Patrick Troughton in the Two Doctors, and to also um, get to work with on the sort of Stranger series, the other Doctors, but um, also to um, just. In the time that I spent in Doctor Who, I just thought I was particularly blessed in, in how many things I got to do. I got a regeneration. Um, I got um, to work with a, another doctor as part of a special. Um, so when I looked at all the things that you could experience as a companion, I just thought I was particularly blessed. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I didn't know that Peter Davison was leaving when I started. Um, and my first thought was, oh, and my second thought was, I get a regeneration. So I was very excited about that. And I was, a, um, the first doctor that I really remembered well was John Pertwee. Um, 
but I really enjoyed going back and looking at all the Pat Troughton episodes, which I thought were just wonderful. And as Colin always points out, um, Pat had the toughest job to make the second Doctor work, because if it hadn't, there would be no more Doctor Who. And so it felt such an honour to uh, get to work with, with Pat Troughton. And we got to go abroad as well, to go to Seville. So I just felt, as packages go, costume aside, um, I was very, very blessed to have the role of Perry and, and so many wonderful experiences with different doctors. But of course, Colin is my doctor. Yeah, no Colin. one else. Is. <laughs> is my companion. <laughs> oh, I feel like we've brought something back together. It's lovely. Thank you. Um, we've got some uh, final questions here. Um, uh, they're up for both of you. So Lisa would like to know, which monsters from the most recent series would you have liked or not liked to have faced when you were in Doctor Who? Uh, so it's a question to both of you. Have, have both of you watched the new series and, and seen any of the monsters and, and fancy taking them on or quite the opposite? Yeah. Yep. Um, I'll go first if you like. Um, right. I like the I like the Slitheen. They fart. I think that's <laughs> brilliant. A farting monster is the kind of monster I'd like to deal with. Um, clearly, they enjoy their food, um, and are unashamed of letting you know they enjoy their food. So even though they are allegedly monsters, um, I think I'd enjoy their company. Well, maybe at a distance. And how about you, Nicola? Um, I would like to incorporate something that Colin has previously mentioned, which is um, with the, oh, see, now my brain's gone, the, the angels, the weeping angels that appear. Because I think uh, the six, Sixie and Perry would have found a way around this. Because if it's don't think, you can do that thing, and then that one, and then that one. So we would have, between us, like one eye at a time, holding hands, have escaped from these um, and, and really shown the younger folk how to do it properly. We would have, we would have tackled them. That's genius. Although, you need a writer immediately. <laughs> I have had, uh, since then, um, a big finish episode featuring the angels who the writer had picked up on my statement about that and nullified it by saying one eye won't do it doctor <laughs> and get it anyway so i thought that was quite clever yes yeah, I mean, they were voted the most frightening Doctor Who monsters, although I still think if you go back in history, some of those early, certainly the Sontarans the first time round looked like potatoes. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Uh, another one for both of you. Uh, Christopher wants to know, did you make up tasks for each of the buttons and levers on the TARDIS or was it always just at random? Well, Colin's already shaking his head. There were no tasks then, Colin. Well, there were two of them. There was one that opened the door and one that opened the screen to look at what's outside. And the rest was winging it. <laughs> Just press it random, it'll all be fine. Um, fantastic. Uh, Paul would like to know, pointless celebrities, you were robbed. Um, who would you <laughs> like to take on next? So Nicola, have you got a choice if you'd like to take on anybody who's ever appeared in Who? Oh, or to, to go on the show and do it again. Well, uh, nothing could top uh, doing Pointless Celebrities with Colin, of course. Um, oh, well, maybe just a, a mixing up then of the uh, generations of Doctor Who. So maybe to go on with someone from New Who. Um, that would be fun. Um, I, I, would, I would be willing to take on any of the other Doctors. <laughs> <laughs> and and who would you like to go up against, Colin? Who do you think you could take down and pointless and get all the way to the final? Anyone. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. You were robbed, you say? That's what. That's exactly what Paul said. He said you were robbed. So there we go. Um, the I've got one. Thing about pointless is that you've got to second guess what other people know, and I assume everybody knows everything. 
Like we can't all be as bright as you. Yes, they can. <laughs> they should. Yeah, we should. Definitely should. Um, so final question, and this is a, a, a little personal one, but Samantha would like to know, you are both animal lovers. How many animals do you share your life with? Uh, so Colin, do you have lots of animals in your home or is it, is, is it cats we've on got, brooches? We've got three horses, eight chickens, five cats and two dogs at the moment. That's all. That's all at the moment. <laughs> Fresh eggs, brilliant. We used to have an awful lot more. We were up around 20 guinea pigs at one time. Um, and we had four dogs at one time. But because of me being an incipient geriatric, uh, we don't want to get too many young animals now because you know, the logic says, etc. cetera. Um, so as they shuffle off this mortal coil, we're not replacing but we're stuck with the horses um because my third daughter's horse and she's now married and cleared off um nobody else would want it so we're stuck with it and we've got two shetlands that are its friend so um if anyone ever any of you out there who have daughters who say daddy i'd love a horse and i promise i'll look after it forever shoot them <laughs> The daughters, okay, not the, the horses. And the horses. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Thank you for that, Colin. Um, how about you, Nicola? <laughs> well, um, the guinea pigs have uh, all left now, and um, apart from a large number of garden birds that we're responsible for feeding, I have Harvey, who I've had from a puppy. Marnie, who's my rescue, we got her a few years ago now when she was two. And we are currently fostering another dog, which it looks like he will be spending his remaining days with us. He is 14 years and nine months old. So we're hoping to give him a comfortable rest of his life. So our foster's probably turning into an adoption. That That's a lovely story. <laughs> I'm going to add to mine because you mentioned the birds in the garden. Mm. Well, we have bird food delivered by the sack here. <laughs> yes, we do too. Every night, my wife goes out. Uh, we're very lucky where we live, in the middle of a common and woods. And she goes out with several bags and plates and terrines full of stuff. And there's a place in our woods, which is a secret place, known only to her, I'm not allowed, where at dusk there is a gathering of badgers, muntjac deer, the occasional roe deer, and other small furry creatures waiting for Marion. And if she's late, they look most put out. And sometimes a badger will go, no, that's not what I ordered. Let's <laughs> go for something else. And um, heaven knows what will happen when we leave this common, because... They've all lost will to forage for themselves. And uh, she feeds dozens of them out there. It, and it's expensive. It sounds like you're married to a Disney princess. She's going out there and singing with all the birds. <laughs> She's my Disney princess, yes. Oh, oh, that's lovely. I was going to say that I'd like to uh, come and live in that your Shrek, forest. <laughs> was it Disney? Shrek Disney. So, yeah, Shrek lives. Is that right? I'll be donkey. Um, so <laughs> pick me, please. Well, it's been fantastic talking to you both. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's it's absolutely delightful that you've joined us, and I can't thank you enough. Um, thank you to everybody who's submitted questions. Uh, but on behalf of the National Space Centre and everybody that's joining us, Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. I'm very oh, great. And I would like to say that I've had such good times at the Space Centre over the past years, and it's a lovely place for families to go to. And I hope you're able to provide that welcome and that education and that fun that the Space Centre always does again very soon. We very much hope so. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we hope to be opening our doors again soon. So fingers crossed we can welcome you back again uh, in future years. Uh, but thank you very much.
Uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to uh, Colin and Nicola and Alliance uh, agents uh, for this session. Don't forget that you can still uh, purchase one-to-one -one sessions with our guests. Uh, just follow the links at the end of this session, or they will have been along the bottom of the screen throughout as well. Uh, and do join us once again uh, for more sessions for Brit Sci-Fi. Other than that, stay safe and thank you very much.